So I have to uh, have to say to read that. Would you? Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Adrian Zimmermann, and this is Application, the Type 3 community podcast, sharing your stories, your projects, and the difference you make. Welcome to Application, the Type 3 community podcast. Hi, I'm Adrian Zimmermann, and listen to this week's podcast to find out how snowboarding and open source taste so sweet together. <laughs> One, two. Welcome to Application, the Typo3 Community Podcast. I'm Jeffrey A. McGuire. You can call me Jam. And this is where we celebrate the Typo3 community, sharing your stories, talking about your projects, and the difference you make in, around, and with Typo3 CMS. On this episode of Application, the Typo3 Community Podcast, I got to talk with Adrian Zimmermann from Switzerland, who's been around in the Typo3 community for more than 20 years. And we got a great chance to reminisce about some of the good old days, the origins of the Typo3 board event, and somehow how snowboarding ties back to every single other aspect of Typo3 for Antigun. We talked about a lot of the people who've been around since then, the projects, the ideas, the concepts that come from these long friendships and and activities together around technology. So listen in for some ideas about how open source fits in with business, how things have gone right and wrong there over the years, inter-project cooperations, how we can be better open source friends and citizens together, and a lot more. I hope you enjoy listening to this as much as I did. early 2021. It's mid-January. We are talking on a little thing that I like to call application, the Typo3 community podcast. Adrian Zimmermann, how long have you been doing Typo3? Exactly uh, 20 years, something around this. 20 years. So you were in it right from the beginning, right from the beginning, beginning, beginning. Yeah, almost. (laughs) <laughs> what was the first version that you that you used? What is your or do you have a do you have a first memory? My first memory, of course, was shortly after we started uh, digging into Typo three, when that call from from Casper came uh, to to go snowboarding. Right, that was the the kickoff, so to say. We we started before that, but then he called that into into the community. Let's go snowboarding because of a. I think it was a an advertisement or something that mentioned that uh, web designers should be snowboarders as well. And uh, that was in Denmark somewhere. And Casper took that for uh, literally. <laughs> and then <laughs> and then he, he he set up the first snowboard tour in, in Baltkastein, 2002. Right. right. So this is a great Typo3 community tradition. I think it also speaks to Typo3's Central European origins, but the idea of a community conference organized around skiing is fantastic. I really like it. I haven't been on one yet. So have you been on all of them? Not quite all. I think I missed like three or four. This was in the last uh, few years when I had to go uh, I had to go where I could go uh, with my family to the to the mountains. But recently I started again and I will try to to go there. Speaking of skiing, I made I think what is a very grown up decision for, for me. <laughs> I decided to not do as many exercises that stress my knees so that I can ski a few years longer. Okay, so <laughs> Kind of uh, do a contingent, which uh, which allows you. Okay. Right, because I hate to admit it, but things things have started to hurt sometimes that didn't used to hurt, and uh, I want to have. Yeah, some... I have a exact, exactly the same the same priority for for me with snowboarding. Or if if you, if people ask me, uh, what is the difference between twenty years ago and now? Do you feel older? What can you do, and what not? Snowboarding is absolute priority. I have to do this uh, some more twenty years, and I will put everything uh, along that. I nice, will, uh, Adrian Zimmermann. Why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us who you are and what you do. I'm Adrian. Like as I said, twenty years now somehow connected with Type Three. I started with my 
friend, uh, Dominic Brander and Marcus Rona, with my two friends, I started Snowflake Productions 1999. It started, and again, uh, that's what, what suits the whole story. It started as a um, snowboard portal. Aha. It started with border.ch which was uh, a hobby we did, we, the three of us, we did a, a snowboard portal where we already had a database of all Swiss resorts with like snow, snow height, uh, snowfall, lost snowfall, how many half pipes, all the stuff you need for a snow report. We fetched already from a database from uh, Switzerland Tourism. We could do that because Dominic worked there before or, and, and had some connections. Ah. This portal was very successful. We had like 600 sessions a day back there in 1999, which is not, not bad. And we had also chats and forums and things going on. And then we had the idea to sell banners. Banner ad. And, you know, the, the 90s, huh? we, we sell banners. <laughs> and... Uh, we wrote a letter to all of the ski resorts, 150 ski resorts, and tell them if you want to keep your resort on our portal, you have to pay like 200 francs uh, uh, for a season. And to do that, we, we did the company, Snowflake Productions. So the company wrote that letter to all those resorts. That was uh -huh. when we founded Snowflake Productions. It started like this and no resort at all paid the fee. But <laughs> because the internet was just a passing fad, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The internet was dying, but we had a company and then we started. 1999, we started. And uh, today we are here. And what sort of projects does Snowflake do now? We do, do a lot of things for uh, government. That's the big ones. We have like, in Germany, you have the Länder, we have the Kantons. We do like uh, Kantons website. Mm -hmm. We do Fachhochschulen, universities, stuff like that. So that's what we do with uh, tenders. We go for tenders and do okay. this, this government stuff. And then we also do economy stuff, normal websites, corporate websites. It's, it's a huge broad area, which we also want to keep. If you could start over now, would you take a different path in learning Typo3? Or if you were looking for a technology now, do you think that you would gravitate towards Typo3? Yeah, definitely. We would do it the same way. It, it was it was definitely the right decision. What was your background? It sounds like your choice back twenty years ago. Your choice was a very technical one, and you looked at the code and you decided that that you had some affinity to that. What what is your background? I'm a educated programmer. I did a, a programmer practica first after high school. Four years, I, I worked as a programmer. I did some banking software. I worked on HP systems with, with that with that powerhouse language. Did some applications. Then I uh, studied Wirtschaftsinformatik. Ah, so science of so IT. I don't know. Computer science focused computer on science. business, right? Yeah, exactly. And that was when I finished ninety eight. So and then I was of course really eager to go to go for something. And and then one year later we started with. With Snowflake. First, I wanted to focus. Uh, also, we were like only six people in that in that agency where where we did the applications uh, mm. for for banks and stuff. And there, I wanted to open a new branch, internet. Let's do internet stuff. But uh, uh, the CEO there wasn't interesting. <laughs> <laughs> was was not interested at all. Our oh, internet, it's not interesting. So um, I did that call with Dominic and and said, let's let's try it. Let's try it. I want to go into that direction anyway. It was a good decision. And, and also Dominic came from the technical background, so we really were like the technicians and the the coders. That was the um, really the dawn of the open source era as well. Outside of academic circles, did you know that you wanted? to work with an open source technology? Yeah, when we had to to evaluate a, a CMS for um, Greenpeace, because we worked for Greenpeace mm -hmm. uh, at that time, we had Marcus, uh, the other partner, was webmaster of Greenpeace. So we could take that mandate into, into Snowflake. And then there was, in the year 2000, there was that question about the CMS. 
they had to they had to have a new one or a CMS at all because we did it all with Dreamweaver, of course, at that right, time. Right, right. So right. they were evaluating a CMS and they were also asking us. And then we we uh, first took a look at what is what is it what is uh, out there. The decision for open source came really fast because, of course, NGOs like Greenpeace or Terre des Hommes, which we did uh, one year later, of course, they they were related to open source. They they couldn't pay uh, lots of, of license fees. And we grew up with, with those NGOs. We know a lot of people working in NGOs. So that was, for us, it was clear that we go the open source way. I think that the um, open source in general is really grew up doing politics, activism, and entertainment, right? And to this day, there's a ton of NGOs and charities who focus on using open source software and a lot of practitioners whose entire practices are around building good donation flows and helping helping activism in general. And I just think it's a great crossover as well. And open source has attracted so many idealists along the way. Plus, the you know the next open source argument you can use is, of course, any money you have to spend with us, we're going to give you features for it. We're going to give you functionality. We're going to give you value when we work for you. So the other interesting thing that I find important that I always come back to is uh, the revelation I had talking with someone eventually how when you choose open source software, you also choose to invest in your local economy. You don't have to send money back to, you know, Redmond in Washington or wherever HP is based or wherever IBM is based because you get all the tools and then you pay Snowflake in Zurich or you pay whoever it is in Cologne or you pay whoever it is in London to do the work. And then the money and, and, and especially government money, if it's our taxes, it all stays in our own economy. I think it's really empowering and it probably fits with the mindset of this target group of people too. That was the thinking of NGOs and, and institutions like this. They don't have much money, so they want to invest it really in, in the thing with a, with a company near them. It's the best way. I think open source really grew through through those NGOs and institutions. So Snowflake Productions, the three of you started it because you liked snowboarding and you were trying to trick the resorts into paying you to go snowboarding. How big is it now? We are like uh, 30 people in Switzerland, working in Bern, Zurich, mostly. We have like affiliates also in Basel, in St. Gallen and uh, Luzern. If someone came to you now looking for a career in technology, would you point them towards Typo3? And if you would, how would you tell them to get started? We are not doing only Typo3 right now, but everything PHP related. You wouldn't have to be only Typo3 fixed. We have like three teams, PHP teams, they do Typo3, they do Magento, they do uh, uh, applications individually. It's a good start to start with Typo3 uh, with, with all those tutorials to have a very fast result of a, of a nice web page. That's how we do it. Mm. Can you compare, uh, I don't know, maybe the perspective is learning Typo3 now compared to the, the bad old days of PHP. Typo3 is incredibly standards-based, right? If someone already knows PHP and is familiar with implementing things based on the PSR standards, they're going to be able to come in and recognize an awful lot of what's going on out of the gate and learn transferable skills too, probably. I'm not too deep anymore in that technical base, how, how Typo3 comes today, 20 years later. I think it's still a good thing to 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 dive into it and to go through really the I don't know if you need TypeScript anymore I don't think so but of course you have if you if you still know it you have uh, advantages. <laughs> what is the coolest thing you ever built with Typo3? One of course was also when we when we lifted that uh, border.ch portal to Typo3. First it was HTML only, then we, we moved it to Typo3. That was, of course, for us uh, because it was the first big Typo3 uh, website uh -huh. with, with all those resorts. The huge websites uh, we did for the government, the, the Cantons website, and that's, that's just massive content, mm -hmm. lots of functions. That's really nice to do. And it never, it, I mean, it grows, it grows. And now we, we have to do upgrades and it never stops and it's still working. Right. <laughs> that's that's really great. In 2021, digitalized services are more important than ever. Getting that yeah. government work done uh, uh, remotely is, is more important than ever. Typo3 has a pretty big presence in government infrastructure overall. Swiss government, the Quebec government, a lot of municipalities in Holland, right? And... Um, um, a couple of governments in Africa, as we found out in the last couple of years. It's a yeah. 
and we want to increase it again in Switzerland. We had we had a um, lots of websites, governmental websites, going on like um, five years ago. Then there was um, a huge tender from the military section. What the Americans would call the Department of Defense or the Defense yeah, Ministry, exactly. right? They had a tender going on for like everything, setting everything new. First, first there was like the Department of IT themselves. They did um, a tender which they want to have the, the whole base of CMS for the whole government because the, the IT department gives a, a base to all those uh, who want to take it from the governments. Ah, sure. They don't have to, but they can. And that base was end of life. So they had to do a new one. They have to buy a new one. And uh, it was a huge tender and some AEM company won it <gasps> here in Switzerland. Oh, terrible. And <laughs> one month later, the Department of Defense did almost the same tender. And again, the AEM company won. And then the Adobe, um, Adobe Experience Manager for exactly. anyone who doesn't know the terrible acronym. <laughs> yeah, so they had like two almost identical projects uh, to the same company with the same system. Some months later, this was uh, seen by the um, controlling instance of the government, the financial controlling instance. So hey, uh, and and. Yeah, I have to say that one one of the projects is like 14 million Swiss uh -huh. francs heavy, yeah. and the other one again like 16 million. So yeah. they spent like 30 million to build a base CMS where we all know we built a CMS from scratch, uh, thousands of CMSs for scratch for 30 million. <laughs> so, and this was not a very complex uh, thing. It, it's just base CMS functions. But I don't know what you have to pay for uh, towards Adobe if you want to do governmental stuff. Of course, half of it goes to Adobe. Then this financial control institution said, okay, two same projects, same company. We have to make sure that they don't sell the same function twice. Huh? So this was on the hard <laughs> controlling then. And then the council, the federal council, the Bundesrat also saw that. And then he decided, and that was a really bad decision, that from now on, it's not anymore a choice if you have to, to take the, the AEM system then, but you have to. So they said, if we invest that much money, it's mandatory to take OEM for everything. And so from one day to another, uh, we were out with Typo 3. And no more tenders, no more, ooh. Yeah. So... The, the clients we had in government with with the uh, type of three and they were really happy we had four or five big ones they had to get off type of three within a year and change to aem <laughs> and now we are like five years later i'm fighting also with a uh, with a group of parliaments uh, with a parliamentarische gruppe paldigi.ch we we're working for os also within government we, we are fighting a lot there when you're preparing a government tender, what are the accessibility requirements like in Switzerland? And do you, how do you find meeting them with Typo3? Yeah, we, we work together there with Access for All. It's an institution where you can like uh, so do the certificates about AA, AA and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Of course, in tenders, they have they have like those, those requirements. Uh, accessibility is always important, but in the end, to be honest, most of the time it, it's it's far too expensive to really put it to to like double a or aa plus and uh, often the money is not there anymore to to go also in this level so it's always it's it, they want to have it it's nice to have but uh, in the end the budgets are too low and uh, they they rather oh. use the money to to uh, set off all the functions they need is there a is there a law that says it has to be to a certain standard, but nobody actually checks, or what's the reality uh, there? No, there's not a there's not a law. There's just recommendations. There are some, of course, there are some uh, governmental institutions which have to fulfill a certain level, yeah. but for most of them, it's it's nice to have. They don't have to. So in the end, since they don't have to, they they spend the money elsewhere. Speaking of open source, and I'm super super interested in finding out more about your uh, um, was it 
what did you call it? Parley CH? What is the open source lobbying group? Uh, Parldigi.ch. Uh, oh, Parl and we at, with, with Snowflake, we are like um, a partner of that group. You and I most recently spoke because I was hosting a Drupal event, a Drupal awards show, and you were on the jury judging Drupal websites. How was that for you? And and how do you feel about this inter-community sort of activity? That was really great. It was it was the second time I, I, I was in the jury. I was invited, which makes me really happy. And uh, it's it's uh, very interesting, really. Great projects. There's a ton of commonalities under the hood. Technically, it's all PHP. It's standards-based and so on. And I feel that I know both systems quite well, and I think that they are both good for a lot of things. And I also think that there's so much potential digital business out there that nobody needs to fight about this. Nobody needs to be upset that the other project uh, wins one project and one wins one, one wins another. I think that's perfectly okay. They're both fully featured CMSs with with great strengths and great people behind them. And I do, yeah. really, I do really love how the communities are maturing to discover things like awards shows or public relations or the shiny stuff that actually gets more customers introduced, interested in us over time. I like that a lot. Let me ask you, in the Typo3 community, who do you look for for advice or for perspective or for you know the vision of the next thing? Who do you, who do you pay attention to in Typo3? The guys from the GmbH, Mottis and and uh, his team, and also of course Benny Mac. Benny Mac is is um, the core guy where I have a really good connection and uh, visions. He's also coming uh, to Switzerland once a year if possible. I know he so, was. Um, I know he was thinking about doing a beer with Benny tour, uh, just like so as an excuse to go and hang out with more Typo three people and promote it like a user group meeting, but but with beers that would be good. What is it that you're looking forward to in the future of Typo three? What would really be nice. I don't know what the plans are there if there are, but do a, a, a hard usability work over from the back end which it can be a strategy so that you're always used to it it looks almost it looks almost the same for 10 or even 20 years it didn't change too much yeah, so it's way the big colored back end yeah. modules and the the workflows i mean there is so much good in there yeah it's always what strategy you want to go i mean if you have like something working with uh, 6.2 or even older he can just go into 10 and work like he's used to. Of course, that's also an advantage. That, which is pretty awesome. I'm not a UX uh, UX guy, but that's also something. Um, you think it's you think it's time to take a good a, a good cold <laughs> look at it and and see what what could where it could go next. It's very difficult. You cannot do some really completely something new. I mean, perhaps find find a way. I don't know. That's what I would. I would, I would I think it would be very interesting. If you remember the old interface when everything was small and gray and there was a everything on the screen, I think I described it in public as the looking like the control station for a nuclear submarine or something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, it's way better than in those days. And uh, of course it is. Of course. <laughs> it's, not, um, it's, it's, it's good, but we want to be great, right? Yeah. So you like the community. What's your favorite thing about it? I have really found good friends also there. That's what I like. Uh, people which I wouldn't know if, if there wouldn't be the community. Then again, one thing is the T3 board, which is just great. Uh, and, and which was the first ever event around Type of 3. And it's still there. And it's still a... a Wait, that was the very first conference was the snowboarding event? Uh, not a conference, but community event. Let's say oh, okay. community event. That was the, the very first community event around Type of 3. And it's the oldest one. And I I, I had the honor to host it uh, after that podcast dine event, which Casper initiated. I took over for um, several years. And that was just great. Nice. Okay. And also very nice people to what I mentioned in the beginning to to Whistler Canada. Uh -huh. So the community and and uh, and and the base, uh, the T3 board as a base was was enabling us to go to to Whistler Canada to do a special T3 board in Canada with like twenty type of three guys. And then of course the the, the Canadian guys uh, like Phil came also. We even did it again uh, last year. Mm. 
Mm. Phil Fakiti is someone whose name has come up a couple of times. I want to get to him in a moment. Can you talk about a time that the Typo 3 community helped you? Yeah, of course. And after that first Typo 3 uh, tour in Gastein, we had, of course, personal contact to Casper, of course. We had contact to that guy. We could ask him things and, and stuff, and he helped us. And, of course, also Jan Henrik Hoying, which was um, very uh, into the project, one of the first ones. Mattes was also already working with him, I guess, back then, but couldn't attend the tour. But then, of course, he was on the second tour, so I also met him there. And these are great contacts, and they helped a lot, of course. So sure. if you if you have established those contacts to the core, guys that was that was great and also robert lemke was there at the second tour and through robert lemke we met michael hirtis a friend of him in in hamburg and he did the whole hosting together with robert they did some rob's config it was called a, a <laughs> hosting a, a hosting um, interface we could uh, do all the hosting with those guys without those connections we wouldn't be here of course you're reflecting two things and one of them is all of this open source technology comes from humans and comes from individuals and comes from, I have a moment and I have a need and I am now, I can solve it myself because we can share these technologies. Those are incredibly powerful moments for me. And the fact that this actually builds human connection and lets us help each other is, in, is incredible. I, yeah, it's one of the things I love the most about, about this. The spirit I remember exactly when I was um, in Splügen, uh, the second snowboard tour, uh, 2003 in Splügen, Switzerland, when I was discussing with Olivier, who was also at the second tour, um, we were standing on the, on, the, on the stairs and having really enthusiastic discussions where where uh, to, what we where we want to go with Type 3 and what we can do and how we can develop and how we can work together also back then. And that was great to to feel that in one house, one week with all that guy. We didn't sleep almost. We we had sessions whole night, and uh, yeah. It's also interesting to see how many of those names are still around yeah. and still still doing type of three. I think that says something else about the group as well. Yeah. yeah. The other thing that I wanted to point out about your your experience was every question I ask, eventually you come round to. And when we were on T three board. <laughs> and then yeah. when we were in Flugen and when we were there, <laughs> that's the big, the red thread. That's red kind line. of the, the red, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's quite the red line. <laughs> it started with it. It started there. Were there ever any T3 board moments that became software? There was uh, those big hunting nights, buck, buck hunting nights in, uh, oh, in, sure. uh, in Larks especially, where we did an auction, a buck auction hosted by the two uh, Danish guys, mostly uh, Dan Jensen and uh, Mikael uh, from Wildside, where all the participants, and there were like uh, 130 guys there, 130 people on the mountain in logs. We did an auction about beer. So we bought like beer or other stuff for the for the devs. We could like uh, do the auction for box, box 140, how many beers? And uh, so the whole night there would be would be a bug fixing, and of course also other extensions came out of of those uh, of those uh, community weeks. Beer and coding. The, the yeah. great thing. I think that Typo Three isn't well known enough around the world, and I think it's time to spread the word. Again, I think that the system is very professionalized. The release cycles are planned. The software is standards based and very compelling in has a lot of great use cases, a real competitor in terms of fully featured enterprise CMS delivering relevant applications today. What do we need to do that? And where should we go? Yeah, of course, um, biggest market is is Northern America. And uh, we, we try for a long time now. I remember that already back in, in the in the in the first association board or or active members there was Mark Stevenson from uh, from US he was working for some web empowered churches I guess he did so, lots of websites for churches over there also Patrick Comon was was uh, in there for a long time from from Quebec he's still very active but 
but it's quite yeah. hard. To, it's quite. I don't know what it needs to to get into that market really, because also AOE was over there in San Francisco very very soon. But I don't know what is the what is the market size uh, for Type Three in the US or in the, in Canada. Canada is is not too bad, right? The government of Quebec uses Type Three, and that is because Patrick Garmont is there. He brought it in early, and he's taken great care of them, and they're extremely happy. And the Quebecois are. Are, are cultural defenders anyway. And I think they're probably happy to have this thing that's theirs as well. I feel, or I've been told, or I suspect that the problems moving on between Typo 3, 4, and 6, shall we say, and having a fork along the way and all of that really came at an unfortunate time when there was a ton of economic growth in and around open source and a ton of opportunity. And I, I feel that that probably took a lot of the uh, the momentum out, especially in the North American effort. I'm not sure it wasn't because it wasn't type of three wasn't right. It was just that the, the community had a, a difficult moment. I think that I, I think that could be part of the answer. There were some initiatives which I supported all, all back then to do a rebranding for for uh, American and North American market because I think type O is not a very good brand for English speaking uh, countries. That was not supported by the big part of the community, but do you think that also has some some influence in the whole story or is that completely not important? I think that the, the couple decades that we've had of internet have led to an acceptance of weird, strange names for everything because there are so many <laughs> things. Yeah. I, have heard i know a lot of people agree with you i know a lot of people think that i really wonder how much friction that puts in the way to com compared to the cost and confusion of rebranding a 25 year old ecosystem what one word would you use to describe typo 3 and don't say snowboard <laughs> community power now in german to be fair that would be one word um so we'll let you get away with it <laughs> What's your favorite feature of Typo3 or your favorite features? Right now, it's the um, the different uh, device preview. That is pretty cool. So right in the back end of the CMS, uh, you can preview what your work is going to look like on a multitude of screen sizes and, and devices. That's a really good one. Now, yeah, if nice. you had the power, what feature would you add to Typo3 next? It's it's all in there, right? It's difficult. It's all... It's, uh, it's all... <laughs> Also, also SEO stuff. It's all in there. Okay. And what would you take out if you could? What would you remove from it? Nothing. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what is something that you wish people knew about Typo Three, but they don't seem to? The real power of the of the of the clipboard function which uh -huh. I also didn't know how powerful it is. You can do like multi-threading, uh, Stapelverarbeitung and, and uh, lots of powerful things with, with the clipboards. I'm sure that uh, especially editors don't know about it. I have no idea. Typo 3, clipboard, read the documentation for more. I have now an idea what is missing. This would be very nice if you had a, a marketplace completely integrated in, in the Typo 3 backend. Like an e-commerce? package yeah. okay well that that is a nice bit of homework for someone the Maltes is is um is thinking about it already from the beginning of the gmbh he was thinking about uh, such an integrated marketplace <laughs> we did some uh, some front end already not the integration in the back end but we did a front end for for a marketplace platform and uh, at some day we should bring it completely into the system that would be uh, super nice would you like to suggest a guest for us to talk with about Typo3, PHP, open source, the world around all of this? Do you have anyone in mind? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, we talked before about uh, the Canadian guys, Patrick Gaumont and, and Phil Facchetti. Phil, I know both of them. Phil Facchetti is, is uh, the guy from tomorrow. And he works together with Patrick on, on the Quebec um, government, I guess. And he was, of course, on the, on the snowboard tours with us. <laughs> Uh -huh. And he was even, and, and that's the, the other connection, he, he boards on the whole world. He was even with us in, in um, Japan, Nagano, where we did, also did a T3 uh, board. Wow. Also, Thomas Schlepfer would be very interesting, and, and Phil Facchetti. And Phil came over to Nagano. That was when I met him first. 
Wow. I'm not going to go at the snowboard tour again. We are at the snowboard tour, you see. Yeah, and, I, I told you. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, uh, of course, he was in, in, in Whistler uh, the two times. I had a great conversation with Patrick Garmont already for the podcast, and he was in his music studio to do the recording, and he's now done the theme music for this thing. So the crazy theme music for this podcast is actually Patrick's music. And, yeah, I, uh, I saw that. I saw that. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me. I'm really, it sounds like you and I have some more uh, conversations to have and, um, you know, maybe some fun activities coming up, especially yeah. when people could get together again. That would be amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. It's been great to catch up like this. And um, I look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to the Typo 3 Association for sponsoring this podcast. Thank you, B13 and Stephanie Kreutzer, for our logo. Merci beaucoup, Patrick Gaumont, Typo 3 developer and musician extraordinaire, for our theme music. Thanks again to today's guest. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe in the podcast app of your choice and share Application, the Typo 3 Community Podcast, with your friends and colleagues. If you didn't like it, please share it with your enemies. You can find show notes, links, and more information in our posts on typo3.org. Remember, open source software would not be what it is without you. Thank you all for your contributions. Okay, and what is that? What is... Oh, that's a ski, um, a ski trail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spanky's Ladder. It's a double diamond slope in, in uh, Whistler. But perhaps we'll uh, talk about it anyway. <laughs> oh, nice. Okay. Um, I haven't been to Whistler, um, but I would like to go. I skied uh, in. I skied. Let's see. The last time I skied was actually at Breckenridge in Colorado. And the time before that was in Davos. Okay. And boy, I would like to go skiing right now. <sighs> yeah. Yeah.